Thank you, Sai. Any suggestions? Favorites? 532? Okay, 532, Richard. Yeah. 
完之后呢？完之后呢？
We thank you, Lord, for the lovely weather. We thank you for the smiles, for the warmth of not only the sun, but uh, the faces that are here. And we thank you, Lord, that we can have a special service as well. But Lord, we want your Holy Spirit to take charge, to guide us and to be our strength so that everything will be done in a way that truly honors you. This is our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church.
invite you to remain standing, actually, as we read uh, from 1 Samuel um, chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 12 to uh, verse 15. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I'm reading verses 12 to verse 15. And it happened as uh, Hannah continued praying before the Lord, that Eli washed her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in a, her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. And so Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading, reflecting on his word and doing his good word. Amen. Please be seated. It's always a joy when we can have a baby dedication. But the build up to a baby dedication is a long journey. I love to visit the families that will be dedicating their baby and we go through what is a baby dedication and what it is not. And we pray together and prepare for the day so that everything is uh, as smooth as possible. And so on behalf of uh, the Adegbite family, hope I haven't murdered that pronunciation. If I have, then you welcome to my world. You know, that's why I just simply say you can call me NJ. But that's not an excuse for failing to pronounce. I'll have another go. Uh, on behalf of the family, I'd like to welcome you to the baby dedication sector of our worship today. It is the service for praise, Erifelua Adegbite. Okay, let me try again. Uh, Somi is like, she's moving ahead. Let's try that again. Praise, Erifelua Okay, now her expressions are changing gradually. <laughs> Adegbite. Okay, I'm a, unfortunately you'll have to accept that as my best effort, my humble offering. And so we want to uh, go straight into that part of uh, the service, which is part of our worship service. Our message for the day will have in, woven into it aspects that highlight the baby dedication. So we are more than uh, happy to make a start now and do the formalities. But let me draw your attention as we make that start to Psalm 127, verses 3 to 5. And this is a scripture that the family love, and hopefully we can just draw one lesson from it uh, today. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, sorry, verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Okay? Let me solicit your attention. Behold, the children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. And on this special occasion, we want to now invite uh, Larry and Somi and those who are accompanying them to show us how they would normally bring in the baby for dedication and I'll invite them to take the front seats here. And I believe there's going to be a song that accompanies their grand entrance. And we can learn something that some of us are not accustomed to, as was earlier said. Okay, let's uh, invite them in now. Yeah. Thank you. 
shall try some of these moves. <laughs> well, please uh, be seated, and uh, at some point, I'll invite you to come in front. And in fact, at that point, later on, uh, all those who are joining um, the family will ask to have a photo with you, if that's okay, uh, up front here. And... Um, let me quote from one Shireen uh, Simon. She said, being a mother, and let me say and qualify that being a parent as well. Being a mother, a parent, uh, is discovering strength you didn't know you had. It's discovering strengths you didn't know you had and dealing with fears you never knew existed. Now, as a parent, I can testify to that. I hope you too can. Becoming parents and especially becoming a new mom is not only about having someone new in the family, but it's also about experiencing a challenging life for the couple. There'll be ups, there'll be downs, and I'm sure many of us can attest to that. Your time is generally more limited. The days uh, seem to be shorter, the nights seem to be longer when there's children. The bank balance is directly proportional to the number of children and it declines. The body is tired. The emotions can be all over the place. No sleep tends to come your way, at least not enough sleep comes your way. Depression and anxiety may pay you a visit, you know. These guys just love to say hello. They are called depression and anxiety. The mother can experience hormonal changes, and with that may come insecurity. And so it's so lovely to see Somi uh, express her culture uh, freely that way, because it's not easy. It is not easy being a mom. The lust of self-esteem that you have may disappear in the early days of being a parent. Where the Bible says, just to express this in another way, the Bible says in... Uh, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4. It says, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. But abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. What does that mean? Proverbs 14, verse 4. Well, let me try and explain. Where there is no cattle, there is no crops in uh, the kind of uh, farming atmosphere or environment that is being described here. A good harvest requires strong ox for the plow. The Message Bible will actually put it this way. Many of us like the idea of having babies and how they'll look like and, uh, you know, there'll be a mix between daddy and mommy and we are so excited about the idea of having children, you know. Uh, we imagine the pretty clothes, and isn't praise looking lovely today? Look at that bow, you know, the purple bow, matching mommy and daddy. These are the lovely things that we imagine about having children, don't we? Lots of cuddles, no, kuchi kuchi. Everything just seems so nice and beautiful. 
While we may want none of the challenging and dirty responsibilities that come with caring for a, man, uh, a manger, as the, the Bible verse said, the clean manger means you have no oxen. But as the verse said, where, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. Meaning, <laughs> life can seem to be so nice without the children, but when the children come, they are challenging, but still, we love them. We still love them. If you have no oxen, then you will not have many crops or any crops at all. Being blessed with children comes with certain challenges, but they are well worth it. That's how all of us came. You are well worth it even when you were as a baby. But I am sure you caused your parents a lot of challenges. And some may be a little more challenges than other children. I can see a few in the congregation. Your faces tell whether you are a tribal child or not. Well, children are a blessing, says uh, the Bible. But when it says children are a blessing, it's a package blessing because it's a blessing that comes with all the other challenges. So when we read Psalm 127, the bigger picture of the dimensions of what it is to be a blessing need to be taken into consideration. It's a package blessing that includes nappies. Hello, somebody? Mm -hmm. It includes sleepless nights. It includes all the challenges that we know come with having children. It's a package blessing. That doesn't deny the fact that children are a blessing. You can't have the blessing without discovering new strengths and new fears, new emotions that you even didn't know existed. New normal comes to the house, and we need to make the necessary adjustments. With every challenge, God gives strength and coping mechanisms that you need to uh, follow closely. What are the coping mechanisms that would need to apply to you guys? And the prayer is, not only as we go through the sermon, but as you go through life, you will be able to find the right coping mechanisms so that by God's uh, design of giving you praise, you'll be able to cope with it in a way that will still honor God. And the rest of us will be challenged in the coping mechanisms we are using in our own family situations. There may be a need to join a club or society, encourage other people and draw courage from other people. There may be a need to uh, see that this package calls for a certain humility to go and ask those who have had children before and find the best way in dealing with different things. It's a package when it says children are a blessing. And we don't choose the part of the package. Say, okay, don't want to do with nappies. I only want the bit that's to do with, you know, the baby and the cuddles and everything. No, it's a package. And I pray that you will embrace this package and God will give you the strength to be able to manage it. And we'll say a little more uh, in the message. But because... Uh, the rest of you were not there when we had these meetings. Now I would invite these guys to come forward and um, we can just um, ensure that their reasons for having praise dedicated are in line with uh, God's word. So let me invite you to you two to come forward. And after the prayer, we'll have a time where we'll invite everybody else to come forward. Now, to me, their motives were very clear. Uh, but because the rest of us were not there, let me now publicly ask Somi and Larry and uh, to reply to this. Is it your desire to have praise presented to the Lord in dedication? And do you promise uh, to do all in your power to bring this child up as guided by God? It's our desire. Uh, sure? Yes. Final answer? Okay, <laughs> we'll go with that. We'll go with that. And let me also ask the congregation, are you also pledging to support um, uh, praise and somi in raising up praise in the admonition of the Lord? Okay, some say it a little louder than others. Those are the ones to go to for looking at, helping with, uh, with looking after the baby. Well, here the people in uh, Dundee 
through your prayers and actions and words, um, you have pledged to help look after praise. And to the Adegbite family, uh, by bringing praise to dedication, you are also accepting a solemn responsibility, that of dedicating yourselves uh, to train up this child to bring out the best in them according to God's uh, package plan for you and uh, praise. By this symbolic act, you seek to express your belief that this child belongs to God and you are stewards that God wants to use. And so we all join you in dedicating praise and pledge to assist in uh, working together towards the day when this act of dedication by God's grace shall um, be followed by baptism and membership into the church of God. May God bless you and bless praise. We want to now have a prayer. So the last time I held um, praise, she was so lovely and so quiet. And praise is still the same today. Okay, lovely. Well, I am going to kneel here with these guys and uh, invite... Um, uh, us to adopt a posture that's uh, comfortable for us, and we are going to say a prayer for praise. But because it's also another Sabbath event, we also want to use this time to pray for all the needs we have as a church. And in a special way, we want to mark a special prayer for Rose. Uh, where's Rose? She's popped outside. Oh, okay. And that's Charles. Um, their daughter and the family, uh, that's their daughter who was born just a year ago. And uh, she was born at the time when um, her, her granddad, who was a minister of the gospel, sadly passed away. And they remember this occasion and we just want to include them in the prayer and we look forward to the baby dedication. Okay, so lovely to have you, Charles. Okay, we are going to now pray. Dear loving Father, we thank you for this occasion and thank you, Lord, that we can draw so many friends and relatives and uh, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of uh, life and health and strength. We thank you for the members who are here present. They come with different challenges for the day, but we thank you, Lord, for everything that you are doing in their lives. Now we just want to, in a special way, bring our praise. We thank you for the day of her birth. You know everything that Somi has experienced from day one of her life. You know the challenges, the highs and the lows. And you know, Father, the experiences that Larry has had in his life in the preparing to get married, the challenges they had. Oh, Father, you have seen them all. And thank you because you have loved these guys and you have been so gentle to them. They have experienced, Lord, some laws that we cannot even imagine when they have tried for a baby. But now we hold this blessing in our arms and want to dedicate this baby to you and ask for your blessing upon praise and every day of her life and that it will truly be something we look back on and see your hand of grace and mercy in the life of Somi and Larry. And may praise life herself be a, such a blessing to all the people she'll come in contact with all the way to the day father of the special events you have marked for praise may she find her purpose through the guidance of her parents the support of the church and relatives and friends we commit the relatives and friends those who are here workmates uh, the roles that each of them will be playing in being a blessing directly or indirectly to praise we pray that every part of that will go well. And for the church that is witnessing this and the request that we also bring, we ask, Father, that you would be gracious to each and every one of us. In a special sense, Father, we want to ask for your blessing on Rose. We thank you, Lord, for Charles and his family. Thank you, Lord, for the journey of life you have given them and how you've preserved them from harm and danger. They are grieving the loss of a loved one. Please draw near to them. May they feel your pulse and sense your presence right next to them. And may their hearts be fully dedicated to you too. 
and may your blessing be on Rose as she grows up in this hostile world, but with a loving God. This is our prayer. And the prayers, Father, that we lift from the hearts of many in the congregation, we just present them to you. And thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Haven't you? You've been very good. And at this point, sorry. At this point, we'll invite, hey, 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 not too quickly. Stay, please. We still want you. We'll invite um, Togo. She is going to present uh, the gift uh, on behalf of Children's uh, Ministries. And then we want to invite all the friends to come for a special photo. So In fact, okay, go ahead. For baby, and we want to welcome uh, praise to the church and to all the little ones in that room, and we yeah. cannot wait to have you there. So, come on, and let's just take a photo for the children, and I think we will let them as well as well. We have this special letter we do here, um, which is for praise. If the Lord has not come back in 12 years' time, when she turns 12, it's a special letter we have for her. And we are just going to take photos with the uh, elder, and then we will invite everybody to come and join, if that's okay. She's yawning as we are taking photos. Like, that is boring. <laughs> okay, so you guys come and be at the center. And please, we have relatives, we have friends, we have guys from work. We'd just love to have a photo with you. And we actually have some gifts to acknowledge and say thanks for coming and joining with us. So can workmates... Um, Friends, relatives, uh, you guys know. Please come forward. Don't hesitate. Why do I feel there's some uh, workmates who haven't come forward no, or friends who still haven't come forward? Okay. Mm. And the paparazzi will do their job now. <laughs> And the church say, Amen. Amen. So we've got some gifts. Um, she's had enough for the second Okay. <laughs> yes, we do have guys. That is for you. Acknowledging that you could join us today and. Uh, Well, we are so happy you could uh, be here and be part of Praise Lives and uh, be part of Larry and Somi's lives as well. And so may God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Kids. We have been so blessed, haven't we? Yeah, just a test of a different 
baby dedication. So wonderful. We praise and thank God for that. Uh, now it's time to worship God with the wealth that he has blessed you with. I would like to invite our young deacons to take your positions, please, as Richard plays a lovely music for us. Uh, while he's doing that, uh, you can actually give back to the Lord through this conventional way of collecting tithe and offering, or you can do it online by using our bank transfer system. And if you do not have it or you wish to have it, you can get in touch with me or Elder N uh, Pastor NJ or any of the elders or Pastor Neil, our treasurer, he will be happy to supply you with the details. At the end of the service, Pastor Neil will be standing next door there with a card reader if you want to return your tithe and offering using the card reader. He'll be standing next door with a card reader there. Uh, Richard, please. Father who is in heaven, our God, our creator, and our God, our savior, the one who owns the earth and the universe, it's in entirety. We glorify you, Lord, and say thank you for the blessings that you have showered us with, providing us with the means to live so that, Lord, we can have a meaningful life while we are here. But for though from that blessing you have given to us, Lord, we are willingly returning part of it to your service so that this gospel can be spread and reach each and every human being who is living in this world so that your soon coming will be hastened. Lord, receive our gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so it's time for the children's story. So children, do you want to come forward? And I have a story to share with you. Hi, guys. By the way, I saw the things you guys were doing on Adventure Day. Wasn't that lovely? Well done. Very good. Okay, so... Hello, you good? Good to see you. And so let me share uh, this lovely story and I'll be sharing these leaflets um, later as well or make them available just outside. A guy on a bike, how he transformed 20,000 lives. Did I, did I say 20,000? <gasps> 20,000 lives. How do you do that with a bike? How do you become a blessing to 20,000 lives? Well, listen carefully. Mm. Well, you have an idea of what you can do with, 20, with a bike to touch 20,000 lives? What is it? 
I saw your hand. Ride a bike all the time. Okay, okay, okay. Well, let's compare your idea with what's here, right? Okay, so uh, Philip cycled to a farm in uh, the middle of nowhere. Uh, that is um, a place really called Yugora in Australia. And I hope I have pronounced that right. Unbeknown to Philip, the family on this farm was heartbroken. Tom Kent's wife, Mary, had just lost her battle with pneumonia. Tom was in despair while struggling to take care of their, guess how many children they had? Uh, three children struggling with three children? Mm, I'm not sure. Ten? Did you say ten? Sorry, you're just shy of one. Ten? Shy of one? Eleven! They had 11 children. I mean, okay, let's move on. 11 children. Uh, that's a lot of children. Just before Mary had died, the mother of these children that now um, um, Tom was meant to look after, she had asked Tom to promise that he would meet her in heaven and help the children to ultimately join them. Tom promised Mary, I'll do that. Now, with tears in his eyes, he looked for a Bible to see how he could keep uh, his promise. That's when Philip met Tom. But let's back up. Who was Philip in the first place? Well, Philip Ainsley Ricky was born in Scotland in 1846. And in 1888, widowed and divorced, Philip uh, emigrated to, from Scotland to Australia for miserable weather, you know, just left our beautiful son to go to Australia and get some miserable weather. Maybe not quite, but, you know. Uh, looking for a new life, it didn't take quite long to find that new life, and in 1889, he stumbled on some Christian literature, discovered the amazing truths of the Bible, and encountered the real Jesus of Nazareth. He not only found a new country, he also found a new reason to live. Well, Philip now wanted to spread hope. He left his work as an engraver uh, because he wanted God's word to be engraved upon his heart. He was like, no more engraving. I now want God's word to stay in my heart. And on dusty outback roads through dry terrain and under merciless hot Australian sun, Philip rode a bicycle many miles and he was distributing hope-filled Christian literature. Just the kind of books we've shared with uh, the guys who were here for the baby dedication, the kind of books you'll find in the foyer outside for anybody else interested. Uh, Philip was distributing those cycling. One day Philip saw a farmer plowing a field. A man strong in physique, but he had a very broken heart. He was very sad. It was Tom Kent. So Philip listened to Tom's story of heartbreak and saw his condition of pain while he was cycling, 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 and sharing God's word. And he heard of Mary's dying and hope, uh, dying hope. So Philip shared with Tom the Christian book, The Great Controversy. So Tom wrestled with the biblical truths that he read in that book, and with careful study, he accepted the biblical teachings. His new discoveries uh, from the Bible gave Tom the deep comfort that he needed and the amazing assurance that he wanted. He shared his discoveries with his children and his neighbors, and the children and five neighboring families became believers and disciples of Jesus. It was then that Tom knew he could keep his promise to his wife. Fast forward from 1896 to the present day, and this remarkable story continues. When you add the descendants of Tom and other families to the numbers of people these descendants have discipled into Christianity, guess how many people have come to know the Lord from this guy on his bike. We said it at the beginning. 
20,000. Isn't that amazing? Just from cycling your bike and sharing books, 20,000 people have come to know about Jesus and his love. That's 20,000 lives transformed by a faithful guy on a bicycle and a farmer who shared a good book with his family and with his neighbors. Guys, would you love to be touch somebody and share your faith with somebody so that they may come to know about Jesus Christ? Would you like to share your faith? Hmm, well... I'm sure you may find great controversy very hard to share. Maybe for the little children, I have a book that you can go and share, guys. It's Uncle Arthur's Bedtime Stories. That's for the children, by the way. For the adults, we've got a lot of books we've put out there of the copies of Great Controversy and uh, Your Bible and You, which you can take and share with somebody and we don't know what God would do to you and transform many lives. But for the guys here, for each family, I have a special book that you guys can share with another child. Get the permission of their parents. Always do it with your parents um, helping and guiding you. And hopefully somebody may come to know and love Jesus like you do. Is that okay? It's okay. So for your guys' family, who's going to receive the book? Well done, and hope you'll share it. Do I have another book for your guys' family? You don't know. Hmm, let's have it. There is one. There you go. So you guys can go and share that one. And are you going to receive the book for your family? Okay, so hopefully we'll hear how things went when you guys shared this lovely little book. Uh, I remember getting bedtime stories from Uncle Arthur when I was growing. I saw you were very eager to get a book. So your family gets two, right? There you go. And we want to pray. Oh, oh, oh. Have I just forgotten someone who, come, who came for children's story? I'm so sorry. But I will make it up to you. I'll share a book with your parents so that you can go and share it with someone. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you for that smile. That reassures me that my mistake is forgiven. And mom, mom is sharing that smile as well now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and um, if you want to hear more about the story, I met the, uh, Pastor Kent. He shared this story with us, and uh, we were so pleased to have that. He was in Aberdeen and went to Shetland and also went on to uh, Inverness. So we want to thank God for that. Let's pray uh, for this literature that you guys will share. Father, we have some books we've handed to the children. Hopefully they can share them with someone. And we all want to do an active part somehow in sharing the gospel. Please help us to do so. And um, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be the lead. Guide us uh, for the rest of the service, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Good morning, church, or afternoon, afternoon, good afternoon, church. I'll be singing, and my life is in your hands.
I on and your willingness to share it. We want to express our appreciation. It's a special day for somebody who's in the congregation today and we want to recognize uh, them on their 13th birthday. 
and that is Riley. Hiya. Sorry, we don't want to ask you to stand or anything like that. We just want you to sit and be comfortable. But we want to reach out to you and grant you a high five from the air. Shall we do that? Everybody for Riley, a high five. And hope you will enjoy the day and uh, the year ahead. May God bless you as you, um, as you navigate your way to year 14 with your loving parents and uh, relatives and friends and the church family. Is that okay? We won't ask you to stand. Don't worry. Okay. Turn with me back to 1 Samuel as uh, we reflect on a few things uh, before we have our lovely uh, plans for uh, potluck um, and some fellowship, just some time when we can uh, be together as a church family um, on this uh, special day with this special weather that we, we've put out just for you. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, so um, I, I know what it's, it's, it's like to be treated as an outcast. To be treated like the worst option possible, I know what that's like. I know what it is to be bullied, to have my heart poisoned by bitter and provocative words is nothing unfamiliar to me. To have my name mentioned as a rival and misery wished on me repeatedly, to be trending on the lips of uh, family chat groups and those run by various cliques for being me is hypocritically true. I know what it's like to have my confidence read zero and my self-esteem evaporate. I know what it's like to go hungry while I feast on misery and taste only my bitter tears. To be undesirable to many is something I'm familiar with. To be made to feel like a second-class citizen for reasons I have no control over, that I know very well. To be treated as sin, as missing the mark of fertility, just because of something that's gone wrong in my reproductive organs is my painful reality. Quote, unquote, the memoirs of Hannah, the wife of Elkanah. You'll be glad those words are not mine. They are, as I said, the words of Hannah that I've tried to craft together. Not sure if any of us identify with Hannah in any way in that unflinching account. If you've ever been treated less human for reasons beyond your making, they could be something to take home for you today. If, like me, many times you've been the perpetrator, directly or indirectly the agent, the culprit, may you humbly join in too. After all, you too are a child of God, made in God's image, for whom Christ died. You see, Hannah was judged for something she had no control, no control at all over. She was treated like an outcast, not because of anything she had done, but because of something she hadn't done and couldn't do. She couldn't have babies. And for that, she was ill-treated. Not for something she had actively gone out to do, but something she couldn't do, naturally. It's more like being judged for being single in a world of couples, or for being tall or short or having a high cheekbone or a flat nose, uh, big eyes, light or being too dark in complexion, having thick lips or something like that. But nothing seemed more painful as the first night 
the first night that her husband brought home a new young wife called Penina. Overwhelming grief and uh, tears flooded Hannah's heart as she lay alone for the first time since getting married to Elkanah. Then that one man, the one upon whom her hopes had been built, the one who had kind of accepted her, and for matters, to make matters worse, he was a Levite. People who served in the, in the temple. The man who called her honey bunch, a sweetheart, the man who once called her sweetie pie, darling, oh, puki puki. He had brought a new wife and he was calling her those names. And she was out of the picture now. Oh, she was second class citizen at that point. Elkanah had just confirmed her worst fear that she was worthless without a child. Cindy Tooch, an author and a preacher from whom I get so many insights and phrases uh, for this message, uh, further describes it this way. This is what Cindy Tooch says. Hannah saw the, the way people looked at her and heard the whispering. Uh, her heart ached when former friends no longer looked her in the eye or spoke to her. The loneliness covered her like a blanket. And all this, not because of anything Hannah had done, but because of something she hadn't done. Couldn't do. Which was to have babies. Hannah is mentioned only 11 times in the whole Bible. Her story is confined to a chapter and a half before she fades back into her ordinary life. She was a woman in a time when women lived quietly in the background, going about their daily duties and tending to the needs of their families. The Bible simply says Hannah has no, had no children. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 2. Her fertility, or her infertility rather, was seen as a punishment from God in a rather sadly limited socio-religious worldview. That means in my world, Anyone different from my perfect pastor self must be suffering from God's punishment. Hello, somebody? If you have lips that don't measure up to mine, then you are experiencing God's punishment. If you have hair, or rather, if you have no hair, like me, then that means you are suffering God's direct punishment. That was the worldview at that point. And I pity anyone who does not come from Zimbabwe. You have to come from Zimbabwe to be at par with God. So if you are not from Zimbabwe, I'm sorry. I mean, what a narrow worldview we find here. But if it was true, what if God was punishing her? What if God was punishing her? What had she done besides being born barren? What had she done? What had Hannah done to be born barren? You see, as Penina's body grew large with the, the much longed for child, Hannah experienced an increasing level of shame. Why not her? What had she done to deserve this barrenness? But something else was growing in Penina's heart, her own heartache. While God had blessed her with children, she was missing the one thing she wanted most, her husband's love. Penina had the children, but she didn't have her husband's love. The author of 1 Samuel uh, shares the sad battle of these two uh, uh, women. Uh, if, if you read it in verse 4 and 5 of 1 Samuel, uh, it says, whenever the time uh, came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, and, uh, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, verse 5, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. 
although the Lord had closed her womb. Hmm. Hannah longed for a child, singular. Penina had sons and daughters. She had children, plural. Penina longed for her husband's love, but he loved Hannah. So a rivalry grew between the two women who shared a house and a husband. Each woman was to adopt a coping mechanism like we all do, a coping mechanism. How do you cope with not being loved, with being single, with being different, with being intellectual even, when you have not so bright people around you? How do you cope with being you in your world? Well, one wife would use God-given coping mechanisms, prayer, and desperately pouring out her heart to God as if she was drunk. The other wife would keep a sober face and fight like hell and be scheming and hating as her defense mechanism. That was her defense mechanism. She uses bitterness and rivalry, a rebellious heart to intentionally cause Hannah misery. The Bible tells us in verse 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, it says, Hannah's rival provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. I mean, make someone miserable for something they have not done? If you think that hurts, well, Penina is not finished with Hannah. Verse 7 was coming. It says every year, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Hannah wept and did not eat. But maybe we need to uh, pause a little. Uh, you know, Penina's defense mechanism that was provoking uh, Hannah and causing uh, a lot of strife uh, um, needs to be explained a little more. So we need to pause and say, what is a defense mechanism? I'll try and uh, use the, this phrase carefully because it's one of those that are easily loaded. Generally speaking, a defense mechanism or a coping mechanism, and I'll use and treat those synonymously as one, are behaviors that people use to separate themselves from unpleasant events, actions, or thoughts. Now, we each have one or many defense mechanisms. So if Elkanah loves Baron Hannah more than he loves the size 8 breeding machine called Penina, you already see a defense mechanism there if you're carefully following, Penina sets up a defense mechanism, a strategy she may use to cope with different difficult thoughts of being unloved. And so Penina engages a defense mechanism, a coping strategy, because she's not getting the love for, from Elkanah. Psychologists tell us of various coping or defense mechanisms. They tell us of mechanisms called, for example, displacement. That's when we direct strong emotions and frustrations towards a person or object that doesn't feel threatening. Let me explain what I mean. So instead of telling the boss that he was unkind to you at work, uh, Larry, I believe your boss is in the building. Now, be very careful with using this at work, okay? You may get fired, by the way. So instead of telling the boss that he was unkind to you at work, you avoid the risk of getting fired by waiting until you get home and you start taking it out. All the frustration, you take it out on the children, you take it out on your partner, you start wearing a onesie, a two onesies to bed, if you know what I'm talking about. Defense mechanism. Coping strategy. Another one is called regression. Some people who feel threatened or anxious may escape to an earlier stage in their development. That's a coping mechanism that's known. Children like this one. To deal with difficult situations, they may start behaving as if they were younger. They put their thumb in their mouth, and maybe sometimes, sadly, it can even progress to secondary kind of uh, symptoms where there is even bed wetting that's involved. 
Adults may do the same by regressing and doing things like overeating foods they find comforting as a form of regressing. There's many coping mechanisms. You may join a, a kickboxing class to redirect strong emotions. Want to redirect my emotions and you kick in the kickboxing club like crazy. Some of us may join a golfing club and draw the picture of the person who's causing us pain. Penina's picture, you put it on the golf ball and you whack that ball like, like crazy. Suddenly it makes sense why so many pastors in Scotland play golf. I'm talking about Pastor Jimmy, of course, and uh, uh, Pastor Bob Rod and Robin Riches, um, anyone else besides myself. I wonder whose faces they would be drawing or writing on those golf balls. But um, let's save that for another day. Others use coping mechanisms where you behave the opposite way of your instincts, right? Behave the opposite way. They may start being overly happy as a reaction to being very sad. That's their coping mechanism. Some compartmentalize. They choose, uh, for example, not to discuss personal life issues as their coping mechanism. You'll be having potluck and they just make sure, don't talk about anything personal because that's their coping mechanism. Some remove all emotion from their reactions as their coping mechanism. Of course, I'm not a therapist and I will not pretend to be one, but I happen to be in bed with one uh, the last few nights, so you, you can decide if this is helpful or not. By the way, I'm talking about my wife. You know, let's just get that clear. And of course, I'm generalizing. Not everyone hitting a golf ball has a church member's name written on the golf ball. I'm generalizing. But I'll tell you this. Penina's negative defense mechanisms, the behaviors that she uses to separate herself from unpleasant events and actions or thoughts are going to fail for the rest of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. The methods that Penina uses are going to fail. It's not going to work for Eli when his boys are misbehaving and he does nothing about it as his coping mechanisms. It won't work. It's not going to work when Israel demand a king. 1 Samuel chapter 9, 10. A king like all the nations, they say, as their defense mechanism. It's not going to work. It's not going to work when Saul is misbehaving uh, and then the giant Goliath is going to reveal to all Israel whose coping mechanism works better. Is it Saul's or is it David's? It's not going to work for Saul as a coping mechanism. David will literally play the harp to help Saul cope and Saul will try to kill David as he is playing the harp. It's not going to work for Saul. But there's defense and coping mechanisms that do work in 1st and 2nd Samuel. It's the ones that Hannah uses, for example. Hannah puts on the full armor of God. She puts on the full armor of God when she's faced with a difficult situation. Well, you can read the one that's in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. The New International Version will say, uh, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You know what Penina was doing? That was a devil's scheme aimed at Hannah. Paul here in uh, Ephesians is encouraging the church Take your stand against the devil's schemes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth, buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 
in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then verse 18 says, and pray. You want to put on the full armor of God as your coping mechanism? It says, and pray. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Coping mechanisms. The full armor of coping mechanisms. Positive strategies. Where you begin to willingly learn and unlearn. You cooperate with God and his spirit to cope with difficult situations. Empty yourself. Ask God's spirit to come in. Sometimes, like Hannah, you will need to isolate yourself to deal with stuff. You'll, you, you'll take a break from eating in order to deal with stuff. You may even join that golf club as long as you don't draw anyone's picture on the ball. Cooperating with God transforms unhealthy negative defense mechanisms into ones that are more workable in First and Second Samuel. Workable coping mechanisms, godly coping mechanisms. You'll find friends to help you recognize your defense mechanism and how they could be hurting other people using their defense mechanism. You know, friends like Jonathan are found in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Jonathan and David were in the books of uh, 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 Samuel. Uh, friends who will tell you the truth even when it hurts and they will hold you accountable to behaving in a certain way as part of your coping strategy. If you surround yourself with people who will be just yes-sayers, people who will not tell you the truth, you are not helping yourself. Surround yourself with, be accountable to the church. A body that will hold you accountable. These are the things that work in First and Second Samuel. We'll see uh, these uh, 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 things as we go through uh, First and Second Samuel. David will defeat Goliath as the truly anointed king of Israel. David will tell Goliath that you, you come uh, to me with a sword as your coping mechanism, with a javelin and with a spear as your defense mechanisms and your fighting mode. But I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. First Samuel chapter 17 verse 45. That's his coping mechanism. The name of the Lord. And it's going to work. That one will work. When Saul tries to kill David playing his harp, David doesn't fight Saul. He simply gets out of the way of the spear. And the Bible says David behaved himself wisely. You see, as you start going into 1st and 2nd Samuel, the stories ask, what's your coping mechanism? Each of the stories is asking you, are you a Penina or are you a Hana? What's your coping mechanism? You know, ultimately, First and Second Samuel, at least in my understanding, teaches us that in the heart of every religion is the religion of the heart. The heart of every religion is the religion of the heart. You may need to let that marinate a bit. Is the religion of the heart your religion? Or are you an outward person? It's the outward religion that does it for you. The things we see, you know, your works, are they your religion? Well, Penina, that was it, you know. She, she had the babies to tell. Look, I have babies. You don't have anything, Hannah. The Lord was there, and he was looking upon Hannah. In Samuel, there's a clear message. Inward religion, full dependency on God, full armor 
uh, being a man after God's own heart, which we find in the verse says that in Samuel as well, or a religion of the heart, it will win. Any other religion in Samuel will not win. Outward religion of being rebellious, provocative, mean-spirited, condescending, judgmental, it fails dismally in First and Second Samuel. Samuel is the playground of inward heart religion versus outward religion. Hannah versus Penina. You will see it play out for the rest of this uh, book of the Bible. Which one is your coping mechanism? And my prayer is you will adopt a coping mechanism that you can find supported in God's word as a means of living our lives. Hannah was heartbroken. Verse 15 and 16 tell us she was dejected, but she gave it all to God, honestly, completely, and expecting him to answer. She left home with the, she left the, the, the meeting with the confidence and went on to have the children that she had. After all those years, the year came, the year came when Hannah's coping mechanism won. For a long time, it may seem like other coping mechanisms, your hatred, your mean spirit, may seem to win many battles, whether at work or church. You know, some people have a very good conduct of a mean spirit, sadly. It may seem to win when you have arguments with your children. It may seem to win in your marriage, in your place of work. But God is saying, hey, it will not last. The year will come when true heart religion wins. And my prayer is that that will happen for you and you will adopt the coping mechanism that is represented and supported by God's word. May that be your strength into the coming week. Amen. Thank you, Pastor NJ. I think we have been blessed. Uh, I don't know what your coping mechanism is like, which one is working for you, but one thing for sure, God's way is the best coping mechanism we can apply. In closing, we'll sing hymn 547. Hymn 547, Be Thou My Vision.
Let us pray. Father, we are surrounded by different calls and invitations, different invites from a host of uh, coping mechanisms. We pause just to sincerely ask you, Heavenly Father, that you will uh, endorse one that will be so clear to each and every one of us as we study, as we pray, as we live our lives. May it be so clear that that's the preferred one. And may we see it trump all the other ones that are trying to invite us and to, to take center stage in our lives. We ask that you and you only will reign supreme. You'll be our vision, you'll be our outlook, and above all, you'll be deep in our hearts, not just in our lips, in our thoughts, in our sermons, in our singing, but in our hearts. So we invite you there, Father, to have a permanent dwelling place there, and your Holy Spirit, Lord, to lead us from strength to strength. And we pray, Father, that uh, you will lead us to be a blessing to many other people, through what you are doing in us. May it give birth, Father, to a host of uh, means that will draw many other people into a loving relationship with you. So bless us with this, Father, we ask in the living and loving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And may his blessing rest upon each and every one of us now, here and forevermore. Amen. Thank you very much for worshiping together with